So, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining our Svalbard presentation today. Uh, my name is Mary Curry with Adventure Life. Uh, for those of you that don't already know me, uh, I've been selling small ship expedition cruises uh, for a little over 20 years now. I sell small ship cruises all around the world. Um, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming one of our small ship partners from Svalbard to share their expertise with you, Polar Quest. Uh, we have three members of Polar Quest uh, here on board with us today. Camilla and Johan are going to be working in the background and answering many of your questions as the presentation goes on. Uh, but before we start, just wanted to go over a few technical details. Um, as you've probably already noticed, you do not have access to your microphone or video. Those are automatically turned off just so that we can all hear each other. If you're having any problems with your audio, please try using headphones. You can also log out and log back in at any point in time. Maybe try a different browser. Um, if everything is, is having troubles for you, don't dismay. We are gonna be recording the presentation and we will be sending everyone a copy via email. Um, if you have any questions during or after the presentation, there is a little chat bar at the bottom. So just click on the text. There's a little question and answer in the bottom right corner and start writing out your questions. Uh, we're gonna be answering your questions throughout the presentation in writing. And then we're also gonna be addressing a lot of those live after the presentation is done. Uh, all of your questions are saved. So if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will be emailing you the answers by tomorrow. So please, please make sure you're putting in the questions you have and we can get those answered. Um, okay, well with that, it's time for me to introduce you to Nicholas. He is our Svalbard specialist from PolarQuest. He's been with, with them for eight years now, planning and coordinating expeditions. He has extensive Svalbard experience and has traveled to um, all the different seasons, uh, early spring to late fall, and on their different vessels. They actually have a variety of different vessels they'll be telling you about. Uh, Nicholas is a true nature lover, and he's also an awarded nature photographer. He has both silver and gold medals in the World Underwater Photography Championship. So we're really grateful to have Nicholas's expertise here on Svalbard. And with that, I'm going to send it over to him. Thank you, Mary. Thank you a lot. Uh, first, I would like to excuse my English. Uh, it's it's okay, but it's not perfect. Uh, typical Swedish. Um, so, uh, Svalbard. This is, I'm going to speak in approximately 25 minutes about Svalbard. Uh, and I will start just get you knowing where is Svalbard located and what's about Svalbard. And after that, I will resonate the vessels, and then I will go in detail and tell you about what you can uh, see and experience on Svalbard. So Svalbard is located far north in an area called the High Arctic, so it's really, really far north. Uh, it's the same distance between uh, the northernmost part of the mainland of Norway, uh, uh, to longer be in that the same distance to the North Pole itself. Uh, so it's far, it's not far from the North Pole. You can see it here in the red circle. And to the, to the west you have Greenland, and to the right you have the Russian Arctic. So, so that's, that's uh, Longyearbyen, which is the largest settlement you will see in the middle on the red corner as well. And that's what they were flying to. Uh, we're flying from the capital of Norway, which is Oslo, and it's a four hours flight to the largest settlement, which is Longyearbyen. It has 2,500 citizens approximately, living uh, uh, the whole year um, in Longyearbyen. And actually Longyearbyen is actually named after an American entrepreneur that called John Monray Longyear, uh, who started a mining company in Longyearbyen. Uh, and the first, first it was called Longyear City. Um, when when he started mining there, but when the Norwegian bought the company, they renamed it to Longyearbyen uh, instead. So that uh, 
short history about Longyearbyen, which is our hub and there we start our expedition cruises. Nowadays, Longyearbyen is not about coal mining. It's just a little bit coal mining to the, get the energy and the electric uh, up there. Uh, nowadays, Longyearbyen, it's more about the university and tourism. So, but as I said, it's just a starting hub for us in Polar Quest, uh, there we, where we start with the vessels and, uh, and the trips. Uh, we want to explore the, the wilderness of Svalbard, the whole uh, archipelago, and we will go far away from a civilization. Um, Svalbard is covered of over 60% of Svalbard is covered by ice in form of large ice cap, as on the east coast, you have the third largest, largest ice cap in the world. Only Greenland and Antarctica has a larger ice cap than Svalbard. Uh, you also have hundreds of glaciers in the fjords of Svalbard. Uh, and these combined make it 60% of the area is covered by ice. And also during the winter, the, the whole archipelago is covered by pack ice and fjord ice. And it's also so far north that during the winter, there are something called polar night. The sun doesn't go up for several months. And during uh, the summer, then we do the expedition cruises. There are midnight sun from late April uh, until mid-August, which make it uh, light 24 hours per day. So plenty of light and plenty of time to explore Svalbard we do have during our expedition cruises. So, and for me, what's really interesting about Svalbard compared with other places in the Arctic, that is a quite small archipelago, but it and have so much variation and so much dramatic landscapes and great opportunities for wildlife in so small area. Uh, if you go to Greenland, if you go to uh, Can Canadian Arctic or the Russian Arctic, it's more or less the same for a very large area. In, in, in Svalbard, you can just change a fjord and you would see, it will be totally different. And if you go further east, you will have, on the west coast, you have Peaky mountains, uh, high mountains uh, chain, and you have glaciers coming from, from the mountains. And if you go to the east, you have a dry area with polar desert and a total different um, environment, much colder. Uh, so it's really big different just if you're sailing some hours further east or further north. So that is really really interesting to see those difference during a trip uh, on board the vessels and we're doing expedition cruises with three different vessels uh, on Svalbard uh, to the left you have MS Quest uh, and in the middle you have MS Stockholm and to the right you have MS Sjöveien and I will tell you a little bit more about these vessels. Start with Quest. Uh, she is this wonderful, uh, comfortable ship with a maximum of 53 passengers on board. She was uh, refurbished in 2018, uh, both cabins and all. all everything on board uh, interior was refurbished. Um, as I said, she take uh, approximately 50 passengers on board in 26 cabins. Uh, and all of those are outside, outside cabins. Uh, so you, you will have a, a large window in all of those. You can view the wonderful view during in your cabin as well. On the upper deck, 
on Quest, we have a large panorama lounge, which make it possible to sit in and just enjoying the view, take a coffee, listen to a lecture from the guides. Then we have a restaurant for sitting for all passengers. We have a small bar and we have a small library and board as well. On this vessel, we, we have five guides and five zodiacs we're doing outings with. Then you have some picture on the interior. Uh, we have six different cabins categories on Quest. It's twin cabin, twin plus, superior cabin with double beds, and we have owner's cabin as well. Um, so that's a big plus that we have on this vessel that you can choose either a category that suits you. Um, all cabins uh, have private facilities, shower and bathroom in the cabin. Um, and you can also see a picture here to the left on the panorama lounge that I mentioned before. Uh, just wonderful place to, to view uh, all amazing sceneries. And then on the lower deck, we also have a restaurant with portholes. Quest is really a tailor made for exploration. Uh, something I really lo love with Quest is the spacious outer decks. And actually, they are spacious deck all over the ship. So you can, if we see any wildlife, such as whales or the white fluffy ones, the polar bears, then we actually uh, can view them from either side of the ship. So that's really good. And it's very spacious, so it's no problem to, so uh, we'll be crowded at any time. Another really key feature with Quest is the easy, uh, easy zodiac boarding. Um, you have this gangway in uh, water level, which make it very efficient and easy to uh, jump in in the zodiac and jump out. Um, and, we, and we do it very quick as well, which make it possible to to uh, be very flexible. And if we see any wildlife, we can easily jump in and uh, get closer with the zodiacs. Uh, for those who want an even smaller group of, uh, of people traveling with, then we have Stockholm, which only take 12 passengers in six cabins. Uh, she's a classic expedition ship built 1953. Uh, classic interior with beautiful brass details. Um, ideal for families or private groups as well. So uh, if you're keen of shortering her, that's an option as well. Uh, on board this vessel, we have uh, two polar guides and two zodiacs. And we also have some picture of her as well. She has a little bit of smaller cabins. She is something called a K marked in uh, Sweden, which is a culture mark. That means that we can't do what we want with her. So because she is, um, we, we want her in the original um, uh, style. Therefore, she still have the, the bunk beds, which are really great, I think. But of course, uh, so, some people prefer lower beds. Uh, but if you really like this style, it's a wonderful ship. Um, it's a lot of mahongi and wood details and brass details in the lounge, very beautiful. And you also see in the picture here, you have a view from a bridge. All, all our ships have open bridge policy. That's good to know. So you can always uh, sit there or, or standing there and watch the wildlife from the bridge together with the, with the crew. Uh, you also have a picture of a dining room as well. It's small and cozy in Stockholm. Um, people really love the atmosphere that, that she provide. And then we have some exterior uh, uh, picture as well. We have one from a crow nest. 
uh, on Tokom with a pack guy surrounded. Uh, and some from the front as well with a big glacier wall called um, Bråsvällbrenn. This is actually a glacier wall which is 20 miles long. So it's an amazing glacier wall. And the third vessel that we have that we operate with on Svalbard is MS Kvevejen. She also takes 12 passengers. Um, she was built in 1964 and totally refurbished in 2016. And she, she has 12 spacious cabins and same as Stockholm, uh, perfect for private parties as well. And, and also at Stockholm, we have two guides on her together with two Zodiacs for, for outings. She has a little bit of but a modern touch compared with Stockholm. You can see that in the bathroom. Uh, you can see that she also has all beds or lower beds. And some of them are twin uh, beds and some are the sea superior with double beds. So it's different cabins categories to choose, same as Quest you have on Sjöveien. And a uh, picture of a dining area. Uh, and the dining area and the lounge area is actually a, a big room together. Uh, it's a nice area, it, big windows. Actually have seen a lot of cool uh, wildlife from, from a dining table, which is amazing. Um, whales and uh, seals and uh, yeah, even, even uh, uh, seen polar bears from, from the dining room. On the deck, Sjöveien also have a wood-fired hot tub, which is great to have on board, uh, especially if you're doing a polar plunge. Uh, and same as the other ships, spacious decks as well. And so what's, what's the big difference between going on a small um, ship or vessel uh, with 12 or 53 pas uh, passengers compared with the, the norm normally ones, which takes 100 plus, sometimes even 500 people on board. Um, we offer the most exclusive nature experience. Uh, we can reach the most inaccessible sites and fjords on Svalbard. We can be flexible in the itinerary means that we can we can do changes. We can see if we have a bad weather, if we have ice condition that make it possible to go to other places, uh, which might be better, or actually we have better chances to see wildlife somewhere else. We can go there, we can be flexible. And that's key to be a small vessel to do that. Uh, we have a high guide ratio on board. Uh, five guides on Quest and the two others, we have two, as I mentioned before. All guests can go ashore uh, at the same time. And that's good if you have a big group, you, that's not an option. You need to uh, have different uh, time schedule. Uh, even some places on Svalbard, you're not allowed to be more than 200 persons on one landing, landing site. It will be minimal time for waiting uh, to board the Zodiacs. So it's a quick handling and so that you will be in the boats. Um, maximize the time in wilderness. And um, yeah, true expedition style. Uh, and as if you're going on the, the bigger ones and you can reach the smallest fjords, uh, and the sites that we able to do with the, the big, with the small vessels. Uh, long waiting time, often a fixed or set itinerary, uh, and they cannot do be flexible to weather or ice conditions or wildlife. 
often several seatings for lectures, uh, since not uh, space in the lecture hall. Uh, not the same informal atmosphere on board. Uh, and of course, you share you share your experience with hundreds of other peoples as well, compared with maybe only 12 or 50 that you have on the smaller ones. Uh, and as Mary said before, I'm a photographer and I've been on many Polar Quest trips. Um, and I can really say that small ship experience really make a difference, uh, both for the guest, what their experience to the to wilderness will be, but also for the nature itself. Uh, to be in a smaller group, uh, you will make a minor footprint in the area you visited, uh, and also less disturbance to the wildlife as well. Uh, and that is something that's really, really important for us at the Polar Quest. Four outings, uh, we're doing that with Zodiacs, which is a sturdy uh, platform, uh, superb for cruising uh, along glaciers and icebergs uh, or encounter wildlife. Uh, it's a really safe way to, to encounter wildlife in Svalbard. Uh, but it's also a way for us to escorting us from, from the vessel to, to land, to doing uh, hiking uh, or other activities. So every day we start with uh, the Zodiacs and sometimes we're doing only Zodiac cruising um, to explore the wilderness and sometimes we're doing hiking as well. Uh, so that's depending on where we on Svalbard we are and what's uh, what's cooking. And same as amount of people, it's the same with uh, zodiacs as well. To just being two or five zodiacs compared with ten or twenty zodiacs, it's also a big difference when it comes to experience. Uh, um, just imagine turning off the engines uh, in front of uh, a glacier wall like this, uh, sitting among all these ice flows, hearing the sound of Svalbard, of the Arctic. Um, you will hear sparkling uh, bubbles uh, es escaping the ice uh, all over the place. You will hear cracking from the glacier. You will, you will hear far away some some kitty wakes from a from a bird cliff um, to be few people few zodiacs it will really get a better impact uh, and experience for the for the guest On board the ship, we have the guides and we, we have professional polar guides on board all our vessels. Uh, they are equipped with rifle uh, during the landings for bear safety. Uh, but that they're not only there for uh, make it safe or scouting for wildlife, they're also there to provide you with knowledge. So you can, uh, so your impression of the trip uh, can be even better uh, and your uh, understanding for the, for the environment will be even better as well. Uh, and we will do uh, lectures on board the vessels, we will do lectures on land, we will do small talk and lectures in the zodiacs. So during the trip all the time, uh, the guides will tell you, inform you and uh, make you know more about what you are seeing. And that's something we work a lot with. So uh, guides is something that really, really important for us uh, at Polar Quest to have to try to have the best guides uh, possible. Uh, and Svalbard, it's a lot of about the sceneries, the landscape, 
the wildlife, but it's not all about that. It's also a lot of interesting history uh, in Svalbard as well. And we try to visit those places as well and talking about the polar history. Uh, and the Polar Quest have special permission to land on such places as uh, so you see him a picture Virguhamna, which was start of um, uh, crazy Swede they called um, uh, in, with a uh, hot air balloon tried to reach the North Pole. Um, and that's that's something we 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 try to talk about uh, the whaling area uh, and all those expedition that try to reach the North Pole. That's a lot of interesting uh, history to talk about in Svalbard. Uh, so we have to, that's not the trip. It's of course, it's we, we aiming for the, the landscape and will, uh, wildlife, but the polar history has also a small chapter in our, our itinerary as well. So what type of wildlife can we see on Svalbard? Uh, there are a lot of mammals to see, it's a lot of birds to see. Um, and I will talk about that more in detail right now. Uh, on the picture here, you have a horrible seal, which we can see on Svalbard. This is the northernmost uh, colony of horrible seals in the world. Um, and that's one of the seals we can see. Uh, we also have a bigger seal, and you can see here in the picture as well. This is the largest fossil uh, uh, seal uh, on Svalbard. Uh, and this a female can weigh up to 100 pounds. It's a really big seal. Um, and you can really understand uh, that they got the name bearded seal here in the picture because the whiskers that have is really, really long. And they use these whiskers when they're hunting uh, fish and uh, mussels in, in the murky water of Svalbard and especially in front of the glaciers. Uh, so instead of when it's often bad visibility and very dark, they use the whiskers to, to seek up um, uh, the food. It's a really beautiful seal and it is one of the um, uh, more, most important seals for the for the bears for feed on. But we also have even bigger seals as well. This gentleman we also have with the beautiful whiskers and the tusk. This is the walrus, uh, famous for a big tusk. Uh, both males and females have this uh, tusk. Uh, males will be bigger, uh, really big in fact. They can weigh up to 3,000 pounds, uh, fully grown uh, male. And the tusk can be approximately one meter long and weigh 12 pounds. And it's a maximum size of the walrus. So it's a really impressive uh, uh, mammal. And those we, we often see on our cruises on Svalbard. And then they're quite curious. Uh, they sometimes they can come quite close to the zodiac, or we can doing, uh, we can uh, go ashore and uh, see uh, when they gather together in uh, in larger groups, which they often do when they rest, uh, because they rest when they're not feeding on uh, mussels uh, and small fishes. They rest in larger group like this, and here you have a big group of males. Uh, really fascinated uh, uh, mammals, these uh, walruses. Often I say you, you, you come to Svalbard to, to see, to see the, the polar bears, but you come, you come home and you love the walruses. They, they make a big impression of you. And same as the bearded seal, they also use the whiskers, the large whiskers, to, to seek up um, uh, the food um, on the surface floor. 
but we're even bigger mammals on Svalbard than walruses, and that, that's whales. It's a rich cold water surrounding, surrounding Svalbard, uh, and during the summer we, we have plenty of whale species to see on Svalbard. Uh, in, in the picture here, I show you a minke whale, uh, and that's the smallest baleen whale that we have on Svalbard. Uh, but we also have other small uh, whales, such as the beluga, uh, which we often see uh, early in the season, uh, especially in May and June, we see uh, belugas. Uh, and later in the season and during summer, we also see dolphins uh, doing the expeditions. Uh, from uh, July and August, the bigger baleen whales are also uh, possible to see in Svalbard and such as the humpback and the fin whale. And it's also not too seldom that we see the biggest of them all as well, the blue whale. Uh, the last years we have done expedition on Svalbard, we actually had several trips that we've seen the blue whale, which is really interesting. That's a whale that can be up to 28 meters. Um, so it's a really big whale. And then we have a lot of birds as well. Not, not so many species on Svalbard. Uh, instead, we have big numbers of birds instead. In the picture here, you see, um, you see the king eider in the upper left corner and then you see him uh, down there you also have a puffin atlantic puffin and you have a little little orc as well which is the smallest orc and also the most numerous of orcs in uh, svalbard and we also visit very 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 large bird cliffs on svalbard uh, here is one of those called Alkefjellet, which uh, have an enormous amount of birds. Uh, and on every, if you go here in summer, especially June and July, on every shelf in this bird cliff, you will see guillemots. It is the brownish guillemot. Uh, and on this bird cliff, you have 65,000 uh, breeding pairs of uh, brownish guillemots. Uh, together with kitty wakes, puffins, and glocal skull. So it's really crowded when it comes to birds. And often there we see birds, we see foxes. Uh, they often have a den close to, to the, the bird cliff because there are no road rats on Svalbard. So they are dependent on birds. Um, so if we want to see the foxes, and then we, we, we go to the bird cliffs and, and, and scout for them. If, we, if you're doing a trip later in the season, actually they go from the brown summer fur arrow coat to this pure white one. And that's very beautiful. But then you should go in September. Uh, then you, it's possible to see them in this uh, totally white uh, coat. It's really beautiful. Uh, they, they, are, they are so small, the, the polar foxes. When I'm saying they are the same size as a, as a, like a normal house cat. So they are approximately five, five to eight pounds in weight and, and the same size as well. But the insulation of a fur is amazing. They are one of the best furs in, in the world when it comes to insulation. So they can have to be so small, they need to be so very well adapt when it comes to insulation to make it in Svalbard. During the summer, we also have plenty of uh, uh, flower to see. It's a very harsh environment, Svalbard, but due to all nutrients that the birds uh, uh, provide when I go going uh, to the bird cliffs, they, they poo and there will be a lot of nutrients coming to, to, the, to the land as well. And uh, that make it possible to have plants or flowers during summer. So when we're doing hikings in June, July, 
you will have um, you will have small uh, dens of tussocks uh, with with pur purple saxifrag with Svalbard puppy or tuft saxifrag that all those pictures you're seeing here. So it's really beautiful. It, even this so far north and so harsh environment, it's possible to to have plants like this. It's really beautiful. And so for the, the pack ice, uh, the pack ice is a foundation for life here in the high Arctic. It's, as I mentioned before, it's surrounded a Svalbard uh, for several months. Uh, and it's very important for many species which are bound to this environment. Uh, all, always for the smallest one, the zooplankton to the biggest apex predator that are um, bound to this environment. And of course, we explore this pack ice. Uh, our, all our vessels have a good ice class and we are able to gently and uh, navigating in this pack ice. We're not icebreakers, but they are, they are, they are possible to navigate in the pack ice. Uh, so that's what we can do and seek and scout for uh, wildlife. And maybe what's, what people really want to see is it's the bear and the polar bear. It's the largest uh, species of bear in the world. Uh, the male can be up to 1500 pound. So it's a really, really big mammal. Uh, and sea is their territory. Actually, they are not a land mammal. They are classified as a marine mammal uh, since they spend most of their time on the sea ice. Um, some males even don't go to, to the mainland, to the Svalbard. Uh, it's just the females going, going ashore to um, to um, to build a den and uh, to have a baby. That's mainly why they go ashore. Otherwise, some males just follow the pack ice, go further north when it's disappearing. So it's uh, it's, it's uh, really dependent on the, the the pack ice. And our guides scout day and night to find these for the guests, of course, and we do our best and we have a good statistic when it comes to uh, seeing them as well, but you can never guarantee it, of course. Um, but if you're lucky, you will get an amazing encounter with them. Uh, they are perfect adapt for the environment of the Arctic. The thick fur that they have the whole winter, they are great wanderers. Um, they can swim for days uh, if that's necessary. Um, they have paws in size of a dinner plate to be able to go on snow and ice without uh, having problem with it. Um, actually, and, and and the hair in the fur actually they are. Um, it's hollow, which make it even better for insulation since it contain a lot of air in it. So it's a, they are perfect adapt for this really harsh and cold environment uh, in the high Arctic. Early in the season, we see them hunting uh, seals uh, on the ices, both the fjord ice in front of the glaciers and uh, the pack ice that we're visiting. Uh, and if you want a pack ice experience, you should go in early season, like May and June. That's where we really can guarantee the pack ice. It's a big difference between pack ice season. Some years we can be a lot of pack ice. We have pack ice from, from May to August. Some years we only have pack ice close to Svalbard, May and June. So if you want pack ice, then I should recommend you to go early in the season. Later in the season, we often see the bears uh, 
on land instead instead and they are a little bit more um, resting and uh, saving energy uh, energy compared with early season when they often see them hunting seals so they are a little bit different um, but we see uh, bears during the whole season so that's good to know so even if you go in may or if you go in late september it's you have a really good chances to see them and when it's come to seasons uh, i will tell you a little bit what you can what you can um, what's the different is so if you go in, in may which when we start our expeditions in svalbard then you will have a totally different landscape compared with if you're going in summer or in September, which is autumn. Uh, in May, you will have a winter wonderland. It's a beautiful uh, landscape. It's snow covered landscape. You have fjord ice covered many fjords. You have pack ice. So it, you will have a frozen landscape and you will have it purely white. It's just really, really beautiful. Um, and that's why also we see uh, a lot of mammals uh, search at the bears or the walrus or the seals on the ice. Uh, so if you want to see mammals on ice, that's a good season to, to visit Svalbard as well. Um, hiking possibilities are limited due to the snow, of course. We have snowshoes on all our ships, but... Um, it it's, can be tricky to doing uh, outings and hikings uh, in this environment. But Sudia cruising, of course, we're doing that instead and we're doing it a lot. So we're still doing, uh, uh, we will still doing outings and exploring wilderness. And then in June, July, they start melting. The landscape will be visible again. Um, and also the, the pack ice will disincrease and we can go further north and further east. Uh, and therefore in July, we starting doing trips which are 10 nights on board instead of seven. So we can explore even more of the north and east part of the archipelago. So if you want to explore as much as possible and have an opportunity to go to seldom visit places, then I would recommend you to go in in uh, July and August. Then we can go further east, uh, further for to the Russian Arctic. Uh, and if you are a keen hiker, I would say that August September is a wonderful period to 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 visit Svalbard. And also, it's a beautiful light. Um, the the midnight uh, sun ending in mid-August and we're starting to having uh, the sun uh, going down for maybe one hour or two in early September, uh, which make it beautiful colors in the skies and beautiful uh, low light with uh, perfect conditions for photography. Uh, so often we see photographers that want great landscape photography, they prefer to go later in the season just due to the to a nice light they have to offer. Uh, during hikings, we can see another mammals that we haven't spoken about over reindeer. This is a subspecies to the uh, Scandinavian reindeer. Uh, it's much smaller uh, than, than caribou and Scandinavian uh, reindeer. Um, and we have it here called Svalbard reindeer. Uh, in the picture here, you can see a large bull, and this is uh, prime season for him. It's uh, starting to be mating season, so he says have large antlers, uh, and in the middle you have a, a small calf, and you also have a cow. And that's what you can see when we're doing hikings, especially on the west coast, it's very often that we see the reindeers. It's also beautiful uh, coloration in September as well. Uh, so 
the, the meadows and the tundra of Svalbard become a little bit yellowish uh, or brownish and combine with uh, less snow in the mountain, which just make it really beautiful sceneries for those, uh, especially for landscape photographers or for just uh, nature lovers. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, opportunity. And also it's, is less wet in 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 the area so it's easy to do hikings it's not only about the amount of snow it's also a little bit more dry which make it also possible to go to places that we we can't hike during the summer or or the or the spring as i mentioned this beautiful little bit warmer or softer light we can have late in the season it's it's something that photographers really like uh, especially me i i really i really like september when it comes to to uh, the photo uh, photography um, possibilities and also this this picture is also you have the first snow that have came uh, during the night uh, so it's you can see the first snow layer coming, and I think this picture is taken in in mid September. Oh, for the final picture, also will send you uh, talk more about the, the beautiful light that September has to offer. Um, low light, warm light hitting the a small iceberg in front of a glacier. And that's my final uh, picture for this um, uh, short, intense uh, Svalbard uh, webinar. Yeah, I can speak for hours about Svalbard. Uh, it's so much to, to tell. Um, this is just a little bit a glimpse of what you can experience. Um, but I hope you, you, you got an understanding how it's work with expedition cruises on Svalbard uh, and how we doing expeditions on Svalbard with small vessels and how there can be a difference in experience um, with, with the small vessels. So, um, yeah. Camilla, do you have any questions from the audience? Oh, hi, uh, and uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Niklas. And yes, we have received a few questions. We have answered some of you already in writing. And if you have any more questions, please use the tab Q&A in the bottom right corner. So um, some questions for you, Niklas. We have a question from Pete. Um, is it common to get seasick on board? I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so, uh, and that's mainly because we seldom visit. Um, it's a lot of fjords uh, system in in Svalbard, and we can always seek shelter from from uh, bad weather. Uh, and we are seldom in open water as well, so it's it's not so much um, motion on board the vessels that it could be if we're doing compared with Antarctica or Greenland. There can be much more rough due to we don't have any shelter. Svalbard, you have you have an archipelago, uh, and we can always um, be flexible in the schedule, as as, as I said to to uh, go to places they will not will have a harsh weather and a lot of motion on board. Okay, we have then a question from Anne. What should you wear on an expedition in Svalbard? Mm, that's a good question. 
Um, we do we do have uh, an, an intense pre-departure information that we send out to guests before the trip uh, with a recommended pack list, with recommended how you should dress for a, to be warm during the expeditions. So you will be well prepared for the trip in forehand. Um, and what we often recommend is a layer on layer principle, which means that you have a base layer, then you have a mid layer, like a fleece or down jacket, and then you have an outer layer uh, for, for water and wind. Uh, and you also, the mid layer, of course, you can have several of these if it's really cold. Um, so that's normally how we recommend to be dressed for the outings. Um, on board the vessels you have just regular uh, or just casual clothing on, on board um, and new for our vessels uh, this year that we have um, flotation suits for the for the outings so if you're doing only studio cruising you will have a really warm uh, flotation suit that will keep you warm uh, very well so that's also uh, good to know, actually. Thank you. And then we have a question from Mary. Um, mm -hmm. As a single traveler, can I share a cabin or must I book a single cabin? Mm -hmm. It's possible to, to share a cabin on uh, MS Quest and MS Sjöveien. Uh, so you can always book uh, those. Uh, and if you're interested in to sharing MS Stockholm, there is an option as well, but we have a waiting list and we, we, um, we bunch together uh, two single travelers in one cabin. So you cannot book directly on Stockholm as single traveler if you want to share, but you can do that on Quest and, and Sjöveien. Thank you. And then I have a question from Joe. Um, is there a doctor on board? Uh, on board uh, Quest, we have a doctor on board. Um, on our smaller vessels, uh, MS Stockholm and Sjöveien, uh, the crew on board is uh, medical. Um, uh, they have um, courses in medical to handle a crisis, but we have no doctor on board. And then I have a question from Jim. Uh, let's see, option for kayaking. Do you have kayaks on board? Uh, polar plunge tradition. Uh, when it comes to kayaking, we don't have kayaks at all on our vessels. Um, it's a quite uh, big operation to have them as well, but and they are they are also of safety reason we don't do in kayaking as well because they are walruses uh, and there are uh, bears as well that can actually interrupt when you're doing kayaking. So uh, we think that uh, kayaking is not a good option on Svalbard. Um, Antarctica and Greenland are better suited for kayaking. Uh, when it comes to polar plunge, we have a tradition for polar plunge. Uh, we'd always try to uh, uh, encourage people to doing polar plunge on board, uh, especially if we're going to the forest north uh, for the for the trip, uh, etc. We we're trying to to uh, um, to have a polar plunge. And I have a question from Connie. Um, I want to experience both pack ice and hiking. Is June the best month to visit? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so that due to the fact that pack ice can disincrease a lot during the summer and they might 
uh, be very little chance to to get to the pack guys in July and August. Then I would say that June is the best option for for him if you want. And there are since since Svalbard, it's really two different climates. On the west coast, you have a the warm water from a Gulf Stream coming up, and on the east side of the archipelago, you have uh, the the cold icy waters from Russia, which make it really two different climates. So you can hike on the west coast when we are there. Uh, and then when we're just going further east, you will have plenty of pack ice and that experience as well. So that's the great thing with Svalbard that sometimes it can be two different uh, trips in one compared on if you're on the west or on the east coast. But uh, uh, yeah, June is, I would say, the safest one if you both want to hike and uh, experience pack ice. Great. And we got a few questions about uh, equipment, gear, and boots, etc. So, uh, and what is uh, provided on board the ship. So are muck, uh, are muck boots provided on the ships and what gear are provided on board? Uh, except the flotation suits that you have in the Zodiacs, that's the only equipment, that and life jacket, it's the only equipment that we we have for the guest. So clothing and muck boots uh, need to be brought uh, by the guest or rented in Longyearbyen. There is rental service uh, option in Longyearbyen if you don't want to bring your boots uh, with your luggage. So that, that's a, and it's a really great option. And they provided good isolated um, rubber boots, uh, which are really good for this environment that, we, that we're traveling. Thank you. And then we have a question. How many days do you offer for the 12 people boats? Uh, actually, the same. All, all, all three vessels have the same uh, trip itinerary when it comes to. In, in May and June, they are seven nights on board. Uh, and then in July, August and September, they are 10 nights on board. And that's the same for all three vessels. Um, thanks. We have a question from Michael. Please talk just a little about the mosquitoes. Is there any mosquitoes? When and how many, etc.? That's the good thing with Svalbard. You don't have that issue. They are, they are extreme. If if there are mosquitoes, there are very few of them. Um, I have never had any issue with mosquitoes. Uh, on Greenland, on the other hand, then you will have a west coast. You will have plenty of mosquitoes, but you don't have that on Svalbard. It might be if 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 you're going on a wet tundra in maybe in late June, early July, you might have maybe a few of them but that's I, I said I almost say I never quite I don't think I have seen any mosquitoes at all but I heard that they are they are some of them so it's no, no problem great then uh, I think we answered most of the questions uh, one last question here because I see that the time is running out we have a few people that asked about the average age among the guests on board. I think the average age is approximately 60 years. Um, 55, 60 is the average. Uh, a little bit different uh, depending on the vessels. Um, but um, I would say it's we often have a younger age on Quest, um, uh, but it's, 
I would say around 50 to 60. It's our average right now. Yeah, and then how, how physically fit you need to be to go on our... I, that's, a really, that's a really good question. That question that was something I didn't uh, talk about at all. Uh, because, especially on Quest, but also on the smaller vessels as well, we actually possible to, to split the group a little divided in different uh, levels. So if you're doing a hiking, we can do that in three different groups. So we can do it one with um, a low uh, hiking pace and one medium, and then one who really wants to hike uh, to explore something uh, or uh, gaining some altitude as well. Uh, so we that's a good good to have a, a guide ratio that make this possible. And all guides that we have can carry rifle and they can take a group for themselves uh, into, into wilderness. Uh, so that's great advantage that we have that we can divide the group in, in smaller and therefore um, suits uh, suit so, so many different uh, levels of people. Thank you. Uh, I think we managed to answer almost all questions. Uh, if we have any left, we uh, will have to get back to you by email. Try to do that latest by tomorrow. And if you have any more questions that comes up, just uh, call or email Adventure Life. And um, so I just like to thank you, all of you for listening. And I hope that you got a lot of inspiration. We are recording this webinar as well. And we, it's so that you can see it or share it afterwards as well. And also, Niklas, thank you for a, a great presentation tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. so much, Niklas. That was wonderful. <laughs>